Oh, it's fine. I thought I stopped recording. I can listen to my notes back and then record it when I'm, yeah, I can just play it basically back at my leisure, which is good because half the time I say so much, I can't remember what I've said. So this is Exodus 5. I've been reading Genesis. This is as far as I've got so far as reading the whole Bible. Again, with a renewed mind of 100% certainty of who we are as the Black Hebrews. So Exodus 5 is Moses' generation, uh, sorry, Joseph's generation has now passed away due to, um, they had, Joseph had favor with the Pharaoh. So the Egyptians and the Israelites were living peaceably at that time. And then Joseph's generation died out and a new king came up over Egypt who didn't know nothing of Joseph and the a cycle of oppression begins. So it's very gradual as well, how it begins. It, it's very, um, what was the word? One of the words I noted when I read it, I thought some of my thoughts or Bible study notes, because it was very gradual. It was a gradual oppression from how I was reading it. So to the one, okay, I just have a look and also very um, systematic by the Pharaoh. So the Pharaoh was operating under fear. So if I read Exodus, which is Shamat, and it's Parashah, Shamat, which means names. So this is the CJB. It's very, very good for... Um, this, this translation of the Bible is very, very good for being able to get an understanding of the feast days and what specific readings you could read in relation to the scriptures and what time of the year it is. It's very good for that. It takes a little bit to get used to because the King James doesn't do all that, but it's, it's very good for getting a literal kind of understanding with stuff because the word will be very, the words are not ye and everything like that is in plain English. And I enjoy it. It's good. It is the Canazi Jews who narrated or wrote this but it's been very, very good for me to help get my foundations in our culture with the Ruach obviously revealing more to me on top of it. Okay, so as I was saying, Exodus 1, 8, so it says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt. He knew nothing about Yosef, but said to his people, Look, the descendants of Israel have become a people too numerous. So it was always fear. These people, these people, our people, our ancestors were increased in and they were becoming, he said, the people, look, the descendants of Israel have become a people too numerous and powerful for us. Come, let us use wisdom in dealing with them. So craftiness he's using. Otherwise they'll continue to multiply. And in the event of war, they may ally themselves with our enemies, fight against us and leave the land altogether. So why didn't he want, there was the fear of them leaving, the fear of them leaving was political, it wasn't because he loved the Israelites or the Hebrews dearly and he wanted to have them as friends and everything would be great and they'd be dancing and serading and singing songs together, it was nothing like that clearly, it was to do with financial prosperity, slave labour, experienced skilled workers, people that were industrious, fit and able to do all these jobs for really nothing, for pittance, well, for food and board, basically, and have the economy be built up and flourish. That was the reason he had a fear of them leaving. So, there's a plan of ac action that Pharaoh took, which is a, as old as war itself, was to, to put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built for Pharaoh the storage cities of Pitom and Ramesses, and this is going to be a little bit of a class reference because I happen to have my Ramesses Egypt book. <laughs> it's literally, this is what the ancestors built. Um, they, they're some talented people. I'm just going to say that. I don't, <laughs> yeah, they do what they do. So this is our ancestors' handiwork off the back of slavery that still stands today, which is pretty cool, actually, I must say. Um... And it literally says that in the scriptures. So this is why I love to mingle world history with biblical history, because when you know where to look, world history confirms biblical history. So just to make that point, but I'm going to go back to what I was reading now, as I was saying, 
um, the oppression, the cycle of oppression. But just to go back into a bit more of context, so Exodus, Exodus 4 speaks of the interaction between Moses and the Most High. There's it speaks of also here, Exodus 6, that Moses was a dark brother in the fact that it says one of the signs that Yah would perform would be that he would, Moses would put his hand inside a coat and then the coat, and then when he took out his hand, it would be leprous as white as snow. I'll read it. So furthermore, Donna said, now put your hands inside your coat. He put his hand in his coat. When he took it out, his, his hand was leprous, as white as snow. Then God said, Yah said, Yahuwah said, now put your hand back in your coat. He put his hand back in his coat, and when he took it out, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. So that debunks, <laughs> you know, there's other scriptures, are not just to use that one, but there's other ones that you'll find making mention in Revelations. Is here is um, like war. You know the reference of the lamb if, if you go and physically look at a lamb you'll see this roly woolly hair so there's other references which do point to the f the physical attributes of our savior for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear but this points that leprosy is actually a degenerate gene it's not it's something that's unhealthy so it's a dysfunctional genetic disorder basically so according to the word of Yah so that was the first sign he then said if they won't believe you or heed the evidence of the first sign they will be convinced by the second but if they aren't persuaded even by both these signs and still won't listen to what you say then take some water from the river and pour it on the ground the water you take from the ri river will turn into blood on the dry land and this is actually another, there's so much different references in scripture where Yahuwah says he's going to give specific signs for people to do, which this is an example, these are like two examples, not getting on to when the Israelites, the Hebrews were actually delivered from bondage, the house of bondage from slavery, when the final sign, which holds it actually made that very clear and poignant to me as I was listening to her message, her teaching, um, was that they physically put the blood onto their doorposts and they needed to slaughter the blood so they had to do some work so there was some action required and i thought that was very good because speaking about action versus faith faith versus action waiting and how the two need to be married and mingled and combined together to be effective so yeah so these are the signs a couple of the signs that moses was to perform so going back going then on to Exodus 5, which then states, um, Moses and Aaron collectively as a pair went off to uh, Pharaoh to ask the people to go. And he said specifically, this was his message, let my people go so that they can celebrate a festival in the desert to honor me. But Pharaoh replied to his Adoni that I should obey when he says to let Israel go, so obviously he had no idea what yeah they were speaking to. And I remember in the film, it was quite funny actually, I've actually got the like Hollywood version of Exodus and it's like the European nation guy there, like the bald man with his makeup and everything on and his eyeliner. And he's saying when the person who portrays or plays the role of Moses goes to him to say, let my people go, God said, let my people go. He replies to Pharaoh, like what God's, which one? No, I think his exact words is like, which one? And I kind of laughed because obviously the Egyptians were famous for worshipping different various diverse gods. So, yeah. So anyway, and the reason they needed to go to be let go was so that they could sacrifice to Adoni. And it specifically says in this translation, um, let my people go so that they can celebrate a festival in the desert to honor me. So it was to do with having and I, uh, festivals and obviously we're coming into the revelation of how important the festivals and the sab Sabbaths and everything else as we're learning is to the Most High, which is completely and utterly trampled underfoot by Christianity, like just denounced, degraded and trashed. 
So I was just like, that's so in, that's very interesting. The fact that it is this is specific, the specific reason why he's petitioning petitioning Pharaoh to let them go. I say petitioning. He's actually told them, like commanded, demanded, let my people go. But obviously, that goes through different negotiations and everything else. Um, wanted to pick up was or is the people of Israel they say they said the Yah of the Hebrews has met with us please let us go three days journey into the desert so that we can sacrifice to Adonai our Yah's very specific instructions. And it says, otherwise he may strike us with a plague or with a, with this sword. So to my knowledge and understanding, I haven't read anything about Yahuwah specifically um, before this verse. Yahuwah specifically... Hang on. Okay, so it's mainly is is Moses obviously as the the signposting as the oracle. Then I'm going to use that word, or as the leader, the Kohen and the leader who's interacting with the Messiah, with Yeshua, with well, <laughs> with Yahuwah, uh, Yeshua. Yeah, I won't go into that. I haven't got revelation, but I do believe that Yeshua is still present in the what Christianity calls the Old Testament, which is the Tanaka, Yeshua was still present when it talks about um, Abraham going to meet with Malche Malchizedek. That's meant to be a form or a type for Yeshua or po potentially Yeshua under a different name. Um, I haven't got revelation on that. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that. So there's already interactions with Moses and Yah predominantly and Aaron. And then this word is distributed to i'll just use the word the camp or the hebrews in a, a public formal way like public speaking we'd say today would be one person speaking and the others masses listening to what's being said so so yeah they've said he's outlined in if i go to exodus there's so much here. Exodus 3 is outlined basically. Moses as Yeah. We haven't got to Abraham yet. Moses has outlined what is going to be happening. He said it's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. And these are the type of things. Okay, why are these specific things that they're not symbolic, they're literal for the land that you is going to take us into. What is it about honey and what is it about the milk? Because even in other teachings, even in the Muslim faith, there's an emph emphasis, sorry, on paradise or um, the Garden of Eden. I think some of them perhaps even still do refer to it as the Garden of Eden. But there's an emphasis on, there is an emph emphasis on paradise or heaven being a place where there is wine, milk. I think they even said wine as well, the Muslims, and milk and honey. So that, so when I say the milk and honey, and then, you know, I'm promoting on this channel beekeeping and beehives and bee pollination and bee therapies, there's a hidden wisdom in the bees. Let's just say that there's a hidden wisdom in the bees. So... So again, it was three days journey into the desert so that we can sacrifice to Adoni our Yah. So he knows, Moses knows, even back in Genesis, in Exodus 3, that unless it's forced upon Pharaoh, he's not going to let them go. So when we think about our current situation now as being captives in the UK, in America, in wherever you are, whatever Europe, European country you're in, we know from history that they're not knowing the oppressor is not or the system that has been built up on the back of slavery and oppression is not going to let any captives go without the pressure being put on 
and being forced into it. So, mm-hmm. the main point that points I wanted to make is Pharaoh is a work addict, he's a slave past master. So, Exodus 5 for the king of Egypt, otherwise. Um, sorry, the king of Egypt answered him, Then Moses and Aaron, what do you mean by taking the people away from their work? Get back to your labor. Look, Pharaoh added, the population of the land has grown, yet you are trying to have them stop working. So depopulation, that's another tactic that oppressors use, whether it be through birth control. I seen something on some months ago, I think, and it was in relation to the UK's alleged... <laughs> system of giving help quote unquote off help to so-called alleged quote unquote off third world countries and they said they're refusing to give money at this stage but they will supply abortions basically i think that was it to the women in various parts of africa so we see that's nothing new this was the this is the oldest trick in the book population control whether that be through murder slaughter or making it so people can't fulfill the commandment that Yahuwah set which was to be fruitful and to multiply and to populate the earth so then it goes on to say six exodus five six the same day pharaoh ordered the slave masters and the people's foremen you are no longer to provide straw for the bricks the people are making as you did before let them go and gather straw for themselves. So this is a gradual, systematic, um, psychological tactic of war to make the labor more strenuous, more hard work, more mentally taxing, get the people more desperate, more frustrated, more angry in the hope, the oppressor's hope is that the people will just give up and reconcile and just say in their own minds think basically in their minds to say that this is the only thing that's i'm never going to get out of this oppression i will always be a slave forever and just submit to that slavery and accept it as the status quo and that things are never going to change and and then obviously pharaoh or the types for pharaoh get to continue to exploit and prosper off the labor of the hebrews so then that same day, yeah, okay, I've read that. So he said, Exodus 5, 8, but you will require them to reproduce the same quantity of bricks as before. Don't reduce it because they're lazing around. And he's um, saying to these people, they're lazy. And if there's one form of, of, you know, Hebrews that I can, when, you know, say we're not lazy, it would definitely be our ancestors because they had a slave master over them so they worked or they got got whipped they worked or they got whipped and i've often just thought this these are my own thoughts now how transgenerational trauma which is basically trauma that's passed down through generation to generation to generation subconsciously and unconsciously how that can even impact your relationship with labor being able to work today um it could be subconsciously that you feel that you know your ancestors worked for so many decades generations without any real human rights no justice no i say no justice you who gave them justice in the end they never received we've not received justice for what they endured basically today and i've often thought whether that warps the minds of our people of black people with how they even view wanting to work those are just my own thoughts i don't have yeah i don't know if that's something people could be battling with so he said they're lazing around which was just complete and utter trash that, that there was no truth in that they were lazing around they were literally slaving day and day in scorching heat in just disgusting conditions that we couldn't even imagine or i don't think any of us would be able to endure to be completely honest so he said this is why they're crying let us go and sacrifice to our yard give these people harder work to do and they 
that will keep them busy to pay attention to speeches full of lies. So the oppressor, <laughs> the oppressor instills a distrust in the father, a distrust in the most high, that's his job to do. And that's how the, the systems of this world have been so prosperous for so long, because they, basically I say, if something, if a system is working, it's because there's demand for it. And there is, there's demand for the beast system because people don't want to think independently or think or have their minds renewed to the degree that they can then think in relation to Yah's economy, like we're all meant to be partakers of the father's business. As Yeshua said, I, you know, why see my father, do I do I'm about my father's business? So when we're able to renew our minds in that sense that we need to be about the most highs and the father's business is very difficult for a beast system to trap and ensnare us into the slave mindset. The slave mindset requires that you have someone asking you, you know, um, like if, just use an example, I'm not saying you shouldn't be on your nine to five job or that you should not work in the systems of the world because there is a place for working in the systems of the world and even today the most high was saying if you have not been faithful in another's you won't be faithful with your own so there's there's a training phase that everyone needs to go through it's not realistic to expect expect the father to bless you with i don't know that prophecy of the orphanage or that prophecy of the company when you've not been faithful you've never you know worked a day in your life and you've not been faithful over someone else's business or someone else's position so it is basically it's just not going to happen like david was faithful very very faithful over the sheep something that seems so menial to a lot of people in a lot of you know societies how can being faithful and dutiful and um being a good steward over sheep and raising livestock how can that allow you or build the skills in you to be able to be a fit king well it can so i'm so that's basically being faithful over the small things is the road map or the route or the way to being faithful over much so, so the business of the world is what keeps us from being able to really serve the most high this is why i i really do believe that the father's heart is that every single hebrew person would be self-sufficient like how he was in the economy with Abraham you know having his own sheep his own riches he got into times where he was lacking and he needed to go you know and have shelter over under other people the Lord needed to provide in other ways but I, I, I sincerely do believe that the father's highest will for us especially as Hebrews is to be self-sufficient so that if we decide you know what I've been doing this adventure the Lord's blessed it for two years now I'm going to take two months off or three months and I'm just going to focus on the father in this time and I'm going to trust him to provide and I'm going to delegate the work to another brother or sister in the faith who's also very, you know, been wrapped, who's operating in this comp in the father's business and I'm going to do that. Like we, we should be able to have the freedoms to do these things. This is what Jesus was saying when he said that we would have life and we would have it more abundantly it wasn't just thinking about i'm going to sit here and have a horrible life full of poverty and then i'm going to wait for jesus to return he wasn't speaking about that he was speaking about this life making it very prosperous i'm not talking about riches there's a huge difference between prosperity and wealth and being blessed and that can look different for different people but i think the highest wealth and what we should all be aspiring to and what we should all have the heart is that we're in a work in we're in an environment where we're actively pursuing the father and we can pursue him actively um in our working environments i'm not saying it's going to be like that straight away because he's going to take you through different trials and tribulations and training fields and just to see whether you're going to be faithful over something like that because it's not going to be whereby if you haven't done this deadline you can have a physical boss who's phoning you up and saying okay you didn't do this so now you need to do it now, like you need to be, come to a place of leadership, stewardship <clears throat> over your own life. I'm speaking to myself as well, and own time where you're faithful. So 
you can be trusted. You've been doing this in the secret place for 10 years. So the Lord knows this is second nature to this person. I've watched her over these 10 years. It's in her, it's in a hard drive, it's in a subconscious. I can trust her with this type of prosperity. And I'm not talking about millions. I'm, you know, it could be to run a company. He can trust you to run a, you know, a small company and then he'll increase it gradually five years five years or whatever he does however he's going to do it specifically you know he'll do it but we all need to be on that in the father's business plan every single one of us need to be on that because otherwise you're under this slave mentality this pharaoh system that's just the reality so yeah that is it I'm just going to finish and say because I do believe that if the heart, the if our hearts are for the Father and to live a life where we're free to spend time with Him and to meditate on the things of Him, we don't have to put unnecessary physical pressure and stress onto our bodies going into hostile. You'd be surprised how going into hostile environments like every single day with people who hate you, people who are trying to get you sacked off the job, people who are gossiping about you, people who are conspiring against you, how that can like just drain you spiritually, mentally and emotionally. And I'm not saying again, I know there's seasons and times where Yahuwah uses those things like he did with Saul and David. But I also feel there's times of refreshing and rest and there needs to be that balance in our lives too. So that's it. Okay, so no, just to, another thing he's saying, I don't want to make this too long so it won't upload. So he says, I will no longer give you straw. You go yourselves, Pharaoh, and get straw wherever you can find it, but your output is not to be reduced. So the people were dispersed throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the slave masters kept pressing them. Keep working. Make your daily quota just as when straw was provided. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's slave masters had appointed to be over them, were flogged and asked, Why haven't you fulfilled your quota of bricks yesterday and today as you did formerly? So it says, I'm going to read that again. <clears throat> 